Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Well, I'm going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary. I've been... uh, uh, I can be motivated, and I've been motivated to continue uh, a little bit of what we started on Sunday morning uh, in regard to the fruits of the Spirit. You know, Pastor, will you explain that a little bit further? And so we'll go ahead and do that. I want that, that board to be brought out again, if, uh, if you would. Uh, I think, I think, you can be seated, go ahead. Uh, Did it, what, did it get re, rewritten yet? No, it didn't. Bring it out. Bring it out. Bring it out. Praise the Lord. Open your Bible. Galatians chapter 5, if you would. And, and part, of, part of our study on Sunday mornings, now we're not going to study this particular portion of this on Sunday mornings, uh, on, on, uh, this evening, uh, but we are going to go into something that we just ended with then uh, this past Sunday morning, and that's found in Galatians chapter 5, the, the fruits of the Spirit, or, or what's the, the, the manifestations that come out of the born-again human spirit. Uh, we shared with you that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, by their fruits, you will know them. By their fruits. One of the New Testament prayers is that your fruit would abound. That you'd abound with much fruit. In John chapter 15, now those are three references I've just given you. Uh, and the third is John chapter 15. Matthew 7 and... and uh, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 11, being filled with the fruits. Notice this, being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Not not just partially filled, but that you would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Then in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10, it says that you would walk worthy of the Lord, pleasing Him in every way, being fruitful, not fruity. Fruitful. In every good work, in every good work. Back in in Matthew chapter 7, there's a couple of different verses there. See so many of you taking notes. I'll I'll go go and, and give you a couple of references. Verse 16, you shall know them by their fruits. Verse 20, by their fruits you shall know them. And, uh, and then in, in John chapter, chapter 15, uh, it says in verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you would bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. Uh, and so there's, there's quite a few references in our New Testament about, about fruits that you would bear. And what we've been dealing with on Sunday mornings is righteousness right standing with God, and we've divided into right standing and right living. And very often, you don't hear a great balance on that. And Paul and I had some discussion about that earlier this week. You don't, you don't hear much balance. You have either right standing or right living. And there's a great emphasis on living right and holiness and, and doing the right things and not doing the wrong things, and all of that's appropriate. Or you hear right standing with God almost to the point where it doesn't matter how you live because now you have right standing with God. Once you accept Christ, and I'm not going to go through all of that again, but once you accept Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within you. Again, let's hold our place here and look look real quick over at John chapter 3. 
John chapter 3, and while you're finding that, I'm going to have them put Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 up on the screen. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. And it says here, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, what's it say? He saved us us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of who? So it's the Holy Spirit that does the work. Jesus finished His work on the planet Earth. And and it's become very, very common in America, at least, if not the world, to say you need to invite Jesus into your heart. Jesus came and and he lives in me now. And and he walks with me, he talks with me, and, and how do I know? He lives within my heart. Well, he does in the person of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But the triune God, the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is here on the planet Earth doing all of the work and will of God right now. Yeah. And it's the Holy Spirit that actually comes in and takes up residence on the inside of you. Jesus is on the throne at the right hand of God. And we're not trying to split hairs, we're trying to be scripturally accurate. That's good, Pastor. And with scriptural accuracy, we see that the work in the new birth is done by the Holy Spirit. He comes, He changes you. He washes you, cleanses you, regenerates you, and renews you. You become a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Next verse here, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 6 says, Which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Is the Lord Jesus Christ who fulfilled the will of God, sat down at the Father's right hand, was presented the promised Holy Spirit, and immediately shed that forth or poured that out. That was all in the day of Pentecost preaching that Peter did. And the Holy Spirit came, and from that point forward, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, the Holy Spirit does the work on the inside of them, and they're born again. They're changed. The next verse says, verse 7, that being justified, what does justified mean? declared righteous, declared to be right with God. When you accept the work that Jesus did for you on the cross and declare and proclaim Him to be your Savior and your Lord, the Holy Spirit immediately changes you, renews you, regenerates you, washes and cleanses you, and recreates you. Not on the outside, we'll see that in just a second, but on the inside. And you are justified. At that moment, at that second, you are declared to be right with God. That declaration is made. It's not retracted the next time you make a mistake, fail, falter, stumble, fall, uh, sin, transgress. It's not taken away. That declaration has been made over you. You have right standing with God. Right living before God is, is another aspect of righteousness. When the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it's talking about what's right in his sight. Not right standing with him, but what's right in his sight. When the 23rd Psalm said he leads us in the paths of righteousness, that means he leads us in paths that are pleasing to him and that are right with him. Okay, two separate things, but but, but they're the same subject. All right, we're justified. That means declared righteous. How? By his grace that we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now you're in John chapter 3. Jesus is talking here about being born again. He says in verse 3, unless a man's born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter how bad he wants to or, or, or how much he cries about it. When they pounded on the door of the ark, it was too late. It was already closed. When the five virgins wanted to get in after the, son had, after the king had returned, he said, it's too late. It's too late. There's only one way. It's not by wanting to get in. They all wanted to get in. I know. It's by being born again. Nicodemus said, how can I be born a second time when I'm old? I can't again enter my, my mother's womb. And, and Jesus said, except a man be born of water, that's the, the birth of the flesh. You have to be born into this planet before you can be born again. That, 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 that's, that's just the way it is. You have to be born into the human race before you can be born again. Thank you for your enthusiasm. I can tell you're thinking about that statement. All right. You, you, you must be born of water and, and what? Born of John chapter 3, verse 5. You have to be born of, of water and you have to be born of the Spirit or you can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh I need somebody who can read, who can run really fast and get up here because I'm not going to wait. 
Okay, uh, that which is born of flesh, and what, what see that? No, I didn't write that in there, did I? That's just part of the study Bible. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. What does it mean when it says that which is born of the flesh? Human parents. Human parents, thank you. So, so what your human parents give you is that outward encasement that you live in. That's what your human parents give you. You blame them for them ears and that nose and them toes. And, 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 and uh, uh, that comes from your human parents. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, the 12th chapter, that God is the father of all spirits. So your, 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 your outward encasement, the natural part of you, the temporal part of you comes from your human parents. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And so he doesn't, your, your outward encasement, your flesh doesn't change, your eyesight doesn't change, your hair color doesn't change, uh, uh, the, the shape of your nose doesn't, your jawline doesn't change, your weight doesn't change. That's not what changes. The inside of you is what changes, the part of you that's eternal. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says you are a spirit, you have a soul, that's part of your spirit, spirit and soul are the inner man, and you live inside of a body, spirit, soul, and body. And, and it's, the, it's the inward man, the spirit man, that is born again, changed in the twinkling of an eye. Wasn't right with God the, the minute before and is now right with God. Your soul, that's your mind, your will, your emotions, your intellect, your memory, that's all in the process of renewal. And James chapter 1 says that, 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 that the saving of our soul comes through the engrafted word of God. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 says, you renew your mind. The renewing of the mind, saving of the soul, that's happening through God's word to your soul. Your body, that'll be redeemed one day. Whether it's in a casket, in a grave, at the bottom of the ocean, one day the body is going to be, going to be resurrected and regenerated and bodies will be changed as well in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet blast. But here we see that that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Holy Spirit is the human spirit. And, and he talks about that. Don't marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it will. You hear the sound but can't tell where it came from or whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So it's the Holy Spirit that does that work on the inside of you. And so we look at Galatians chapter 5 and it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now that word but means there's something that came before it, doesn't it? Yeah, that means there's something that came before it. You, you, can, you can pull this off here, uh, lest I have the temptation to turn around and start writing on it. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I shared with you Sunday that I've got verses for every one of the fruits of the Spirit that, that, that I verbalize and I vocalize. And, and, and I shared with you that the first one is love. Notice that it says here the fruit of the Spirit is love. Now, now before we do that, let, let's, count, let's count these, should we? It's not hard. You can count, right? You in the back, you're awake, right? Okay, all right. All right, so, so we can count. So let, let's look at the fruits of the Spirit. How many are there? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So how many fruits of the Spirit? This is not a trick question. Nine fruits of the Spirit. Let's read them again, starting with these two. Go back to 21. We'll, we'll, we'll go backwards. Temperance, that's self-control. Meekness, that's a teachable spirit, humility. Faith or faithfulness. Goodness, that's not hard to determine uh, or define. Gentleness. Long-suffering, that's patience and per perseverance. Peace, joy, and love. These are the nine fruits of the Spirit. Turn over to 1 Corinthians, a few pages to the, to the left, and 1 Corinthians gives us a list of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit. And it's actually identified in verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7, it's actually identified as the manifestation of the Spirit. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit who? Everyone else. The gifts of the Spirit are given, they are manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Now, 
Now, there was a question that we answered a couple weeks ago or started to answer, and it is, it is, how do I know if I have the power of the Holy Spirit, or if, I, if I'm filled with the Spirit, how come I don't have any power? And, and I've fielded questions like this all of my, my pastoral life, which, is, which has been most of my life, and what's the evidence? And most of the time, people want to know, what is the evidence of, of being filled with the Holy Spirit? It's really pretty easy. You ask a spiritual question, you're going to get a, a biblical answer, because that's where all of our spiritual answers are from. You can have other people's testimony and other people's happenings and other people's dreams and visions and other people's experiences. uh, And I don't give a hill of beans for any of them. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, and they were all, when there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I don't see in my Bible there's any other initial evidence. Uh, uh, They had had, uh, Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, and you see it consistently there. There's evidence. All right, then what is the evidence of being born again? What's the evidence of being a Christian? What's the evidence of being saved? Those would be the fruits of the Spirit. Remember it, Jesus said in John 13, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. How? By your your love. That's the first fruit of the Spirit. Now, you may go down through that list and say, well, uh, Pastor, I I really struggle in the area of patience. Uh, I'm not sure I have peace in my life. Uh, I'm not sure. Well, what you're talking about is what you're experiencing, And what the Bible's talking about is what was planted inside of you the moment you were born again. It may not have grown. You may not have allowed it to germinate because of doubt coming out of your mouth and unbelief in your heart. And and you've never allowed the power of our God that's infused you on the inside to actually come on the outside. And that's why the Bible tells you to work out your own salvation with fear and trust. So you're saved and and love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, Faithless, faithfulness and temper that that was all planted in you the see the, the Holy Spirit came in those are actually just the attributes of God those are the attributes of God and a Christian should be a Christ like one those are the attributes of Christ they come from the Spirit of Christ and every Christian ought to excel in ought to herein is the Father glorified that you have much love that you have much joy that you have much peace all the way down through self-control every Christian you included. Not you're the only one that it doesn't, it, it doesn't take place. That's the evidence of you being saved. Yeah. Now, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there is an initial evidence. And people get all hung up on the initial evidence. It's just like, well, there's love in my life, so people know I'm a Christian. What about the other eight? Yeah. <laughs> what about the other eight? And so the initial evidence of being filled with the Holy Spirit, but that's not the only evidence. That's not the only manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, we, we, do, we, we do have to point out that these manifestations in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you're there, these manifestations are given to every man to profit everyone else. In verse 11, all of these, how many of them? All. All of these work by that one and self same spirit. So all of these work by the same spirit dividing. That means he gives the manifestations dividing to every man individually as he wills. And so the fruits of the spirit, there's nowhere in the Bible that it says, well, self-control will excel in your life as God wills. Doesn't say that. It doesn't say there'll be love in your life to the degree that God wills. It doesn't say there's going to be joy in your life whenever the Holy Spirit desires to manifest it. It never says anything like that. It says these were planted inside of you on the mo- at the moment on the day that you were born again. Love, the love of God. Romans 5, 5, the love of God has been shed abroad in your heart. People read Philippians 4, 6, and 7 like, if you'll do this, then God will give you something. Let's read it. Let's read it. Where are you all going? I'm going to pull an audible. Everybody sit down. Because every person that just got up to walk out needs desperately to hear what I'm going to say tonight. 
as we go forward in this. So somebody run over and tell them to just, to, if, if, if they can continue on, let them continue on. If they can't, bring all those kids back in. But I'm here to tell you that our teenagers need to sit attentively in this church service for the next 30 minutes. Yes, it may mean their spiritual future. Amen. Well, Pastor, that sounds like you're kind of overemphasizing. You judge that when we're done. Philippians chapter 4, 6 and 7. It says, be careful for nothing. That means don't be anxious. Philippians 4. There we go. Be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious. Don't be worried about anything. But by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known of God. And, and, and what? And God will give you the peace. That, that's not what the Bible says. Come on. No, that's already implanted in you. Yes. And if you'll do what this yes. verse 6 says, what's already inside of you, which is the peace of God that surpasses all of your ability to understand or comprehend, will keep and guard your heart and mind yes. through Christ Jesus, your Lord. But if you won't do 6, 7 will never manifest. Right. And the peace of God that is already resident inside of you, it'll lay dormant like a seed on the sidewalk. No, the peace of God's already in you. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It doesn't say he'll give you the joy of the Lord. It said the joy of the Lord is our strength. Peter said, I rejoice with joy, indescribable and full of glory. It's already in me. But if I, don't ever, if I don't ever release it, loose it, let it out, if I don't acknowledge it, if I don't practice it, if I don't articulate it, if, I, if I'm not grateful for it, if I don't recognize it, it's going to stay a seed. It's going to stay a seed. It's a fruit, and fruit can grow, and fruit can develop. Two of those fruits are, are faith and love. And he said to the church in Thessalonica, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 3, your, your, your faith groweth exceedingly, and your love for one another abounds. Now, in 1 Thessalonians, he reprimanded them because they were deficient. In 2 Thessalonians, he praises them because it's flourishing. Hallelujah. Deficient, flourishing. Wasn't God's choice. No. It wasn't God's choice. They started developing something. They always had right standing. You can't have the fruits of the Spirit without right standing. And then they develop, and then you get into right living. Every Christian should be identified as a person of love, a person of joy, a person who has great peace. Great peace. Not little peace, great peace. Long-suffering. They are the most patient person. I don't know what, they must have been born with it. Nobody's born patient. Quite the contrary. Give me that bottle. I want it and I want it yesterday. I want it now. I want it 10 minutes before. And, and, and Gentleness. Every Christian ought to be known as a gentle person. Goodness. Every Christian ought to be known as a faithful man, a faithful woman. Faithfulness. That means dependable, reliable, trustworthy. Amen. You can count on them. They keep their word. Faithfulness. Every one of those fruits of the Spirit, that ought to be what identifies you as a Christian. Not the cross around your neck, the Jesus statue <laughs> hanging from your mirror, or your I love the Lord belt buckle. That's okay if you have a belt buckle. I don't even matter to me if you have a statue on, your, on, on the dash of your car, wear a cross necklace. I mean, it's, uh, I, it's better than some things you could wear around your neck, I guess. Come on. <laughs> but that's not what identifies you as a Christian. The fruits of the Spirit identify you as saved, as born again, as righteous. That's what identifies you as the righteousness of God. There's no mark that appears on the back of your hand or the middle of your forehead or, or over the doorpost of your house when you get saved. The evidence is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. That's the evidence. Now, we're right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's keep moving really quick. And it says, for to one is given. This is verse 8. So 7 said the manifestations of the Spirit... 
are given to every man to profit everyone else, and they all work by the same spirit, dividing. That means providing these manifestations to whoever the Lord wants, individually, as He wills. You see that? Yes. Yeah, as He wills. I'm just going to give you a verse there. I'm going to put it up here in the screen real quick. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4 says, God bore them witness both with signs and wonders, diverse or various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to whose will? Yes. According to His will. So the nine fruits of the Spirit, it's going to depend on you whether or not they grow and develop. The nine gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits, gifts of healings, working of miracles, and the gift of special faith. They work as the Spirit wills. You and I have nothing to do with it. Can't claim it. Can't, can't, can't claim it by faith. Can't pray for it says right there again that the gifts of the Holy Spirit work according to His own will. His will. But your love isn't going to increase according to His will. Your joy isn't going to increase according to His will. The fruits of righteousness are your responsibility to increase. He brings them. He plants them. It's my responsibility that they grow and develop. And the Father's glorified if I bear much fruit. The gifts of the Spirit are none of my responsibility whatsoever except to be available, except to be available. Now, count with me. The gifts of the Spirit, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, the gift of special faith, the working of miracles, and the gifts of healings. How many? There's nine. There's nine fruits. That the Holy Spirit implants in every Christian at the moment they're born again. There are nine gifts or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And he chooses where, when, how often, whom he uses. And your responsibility is just being available. Okay, they're not in that order here. Uh, I learned them in that order. They're broken into three particular groups, the power gifts, the revelation gifts, and the vocal gifts. The vocal gifts operate primarily in church services. We read that in chapter 14. We don't have any reference of any of the power gifts. We don't have any reference of any of the revelation gifts. We have continuous instruction in chapter 14 on tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. They operate primarily in church services because they're primarily for believers. They're assigned to unbelievers, but that's God saying something. Now, let's also mention this, that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse verse 3, it says, He that prophesies speaks unto men to edify, exhort, and comfort. If it doesn't edify, that means build up. If it doesn't exhort... That means stir up. If it doesn't comfort, that means cheer up, then it's not prophecy. Prophecy doesn't correct. Prophecy doesn't foretell the future. Prophecy doesn't predict. Prophecy doesn't reprimand. Prophecy does not direct. Well, somebody had a word for me, Pastor, and they told me I was supposed to move to to, uh, New Zealand uh, and a little place called Oogala Boogala, and I was going to be a missionary there. What do you think? I I think uh, you ought to pay no attention to it whatsoever. Prophecy isn't direction. Prophecy is not correction. Prophecy is exhortation, edification, and comfort. Those are the three. The Bible has that verse in there for a good reason. And, and tongues, when they're interpreted, follow the exact same, exactly the same. So who can speak in tongues in a church? Anybody the Lord wishes to. That will yield. 
You know, we've got one or two people that on occasion they walk up to the usher that sits right here at the front at the head of, uh, of this particular aisle and they, then they let him know uh, I've got an utterance to share and at an appropriate time things stop and a microphone is turned on and they give either a prophecy or a tongue or an interpretation of tongues and it's always the same person. I wonder, I wonder if the other 10 or 15 or 20 people in a congregation this size that the Lord wants to use and is, is, is urging uh, to go up and just, just step out one time. And after they did, they realized they didn't die. <laughs> Stepping up and, 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 and just giving an utterance in tongues with the belief and faith that there'd be someone here that would interpret, and there'd be several here that, that were fluent in interpreting. Uh, and, and that's a gift. That's not an understanding. That's not translation. That's, that's a spiritual gift that you re receive of the Lord. Uh, and I wonder, I mean, well, you know, the Lord wants me to stand up and say, uh, the Lord loves you and, and he's with you. Well, that's encouraging. That's a great word of prophecy. Yeah. That may just be what somebody absolutely needed at that moment, but, but most people, oh, I'm scared to death. I would never do that, Pastor. Uh, I, I, think, I, I think my knees would give out if I walked up to the front of a church service and tried to, well, well maybe, maybe get the life group leader's attention. And, 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 and maybe obey the Lord in a smaller group like a men's Bible study on, on, on a Zoom meeting. Maybe, maybe in a phase two meeting, our young adults. Maybe in the youth service. Maybe at some other location. And maybe just take the opportunity to say, Lord, here I am. And if you'd like to use me, I'm available. I'm available. You don't have to be skilled. You just have to be, you just have to be available. So we've got these nine manifestations, all that come to those who've been filled with the Holy Spirit. We've got back here in Galatians, turn back with me if you would. We've got back here in Galatians chapter 5, we've got these fruits of the Spirit, and those are the evidences that a person has been born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit and filled with the Spirit are two different things. Born of the Spirit, nine fruits that are evidence that I'm saved. Nine gifts of the Spirit, nine manifestations that as the Spirit wills, not the initial evidence, but nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit that if He so wills, He can manifest through anyone who's available. You know, who, 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 who would be available. And so back to our list in Galatians, and I'm going to take up here again on Sunday morning and go through and give actual uh, verses uh, along this line. So what's the first verse? First word again, let's go to 23, verse 23, and we'll count them backwards again. What are the nine fruits of being born again, born of the Spirit? Temperance, that's self-control. Meekness. That's teachableness and, and, and a humble spirit. What's what back of verse 22? Faith or faithfulness, goodness, gentleness, long suffering, which also would mean patience or perse perseverance. Next, peace. peace. Next, joy. And next, love. So, so the fruit of the spirit, again, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. What's the first word here? Excuse me? But that's a conjunction. That means he's continuing a thought that he's already begun and already started. Right. But the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the Spirit. So really what he's, he's going to preface this with is what the fruit of the flesh is. Yeah. Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit lusts against the flesh and they're contrary one to the other, so you can't do the things that you want. Yep. Woo! Right. <laughs> no hallelujahs, no shouts, no amens even. No, I, I love the word. <laughs> Verse 16, this I say, walk in the Spirit. That means let the Spirit, let the Holy Spirit dominate and motivate you. Yes. Let the, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That doesn't mean you won't have them. You won't fulfill right. the lusts of the flesh. 
Verse 18, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law now. So he, he says all those things. Walk in the Spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Spirit and the flesh are contrary to one another. Be led by the Spirit, and you're not under the law. Now. Just like an orator to say, <clears throat> now. See, that's not a conjunction. He's starting a thought here. Now. The manifestations of the human carnal flesh are these. And he's going to give this list. But the fruits of the Spirit, the fruits that have been implanted down in you at the moment that you were born again, the manifestations of being born again, but the fruits of the Spirit, this is, this is a comparison of the two. This is a comparison of the two. Now, the, 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 the first four, the first four listed have to do with impurity and immorality. Impurity and immorality. Those are the first four. After that, there's idolatry and witchcraft and hatred. Variance, emulation, wrath, strife, sedition, heresy, envy, murder, drunkenness, reveling, and such like. Now, in the King James Bible, and if we had all night, if I had another hour and a half, then, then you know, we could take every one of these manifestations of the flesh and talk about what is variance. I thought that was something you got from the town board. What is sedition? What is reveling? Is that like birthday parties? <laughs> Pastor, help. And, and, and so we, 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 we look through that particular list, and I was asked, why isn't... Actually, I wasn't asked. I, 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 I'm going to be accurate. Is that right? I just want to be accurate. The Bible doesn't say anything about homosexuality when it talks about sexual immorality. It's not listed. And I've been told, and I can back this up by a couple people here who, uh, who actually have heard it. I've been told, I've read the whole Bible through, and there's nothing about homosexuality or same-sex relationships anywhere in the Bible. Now, that's what I've been told. I mean, I got people shaking their head this way. I got people shaking their head this way. I got people shaking their head this way. <laughs> well, when you tell me that there's nothing in the Bible about something, it just automatically just kind of like lights my fuse. <laughs> because I want to see what's in the Bible, actually. I don't care what society says. I don't care what people on, think. Come on, come I, don't care, I don't care what my friends say. I don't care how many enemies are going are, 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 are to chastise me for bringing this subject up when it's really not even necessary. You brought it up. You said you read the whole Bible through and there's nothing in the Bible about it. Let's find out. Let's find out because what it does list here is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and lasciviousness. So let's just, let, 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 let's just you, you don't mind if we just take a couple minutes and study and, and just identify some of the works of the flesh? That'd be all right? Okay, all right. Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna just. I mean, I don't even have to go very deep. But if you read your Bible, you must not have read Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. No. You must not have read that. You must have missed that. That must have got by you. You must have <laughs> blinked when you were speed reading through, where it said, "If you lie with mankind as with womankind, it is an abomination." You know what abomination means? That means as soon as you hear that word, you just run for your life. Just get as far away from anything that's an abomination to God. Just get as far away as you possibly can. Now, let me say this. 
Let me say it with all sincerity. Don't send me any email about being a hater. I don't hate anybody. I love everybody. God loves everybody. And God loved everybody to the degree that he sent his only begotten son to save everybody who was in sin, in sin me included. And I'm not picking out one sin. You stay tu tuned in long enough to hear me out because the list that we'll look at has gossipers on it as well. Same list. Same list. And, and when, when, when we go down through this list of works of the flesh, we, we read haters and drunks. That's what we read. So I don't hate anybody. I love everybody. I love everybody enough to tell you the truth. And, and we're not talking about anybody's past. I don't care what your past is. God doesn't care what your past is. If it's under the blood, if you've confessed your sin, he's faithful and just, he's forgiven you, and he's cleansed you of all unrighteousness. And, and, and don't think I'm, I'm picking at anybody or picking on anybody. I'm just reading the Bible. This isn't my stance, and, and this isn't what I think. This is what the Bible says. And what the Bible just told us is, for a man to lie with a man as with a woman is an abomination. That's what your Bible says. Read it any way you want. That is what it says. 20 verse 13, Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13. I didn't write the Bible. Did you? No, no God did. He inspired every word in it. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as you lie with a woman. Both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely... Oh, I'll just let you read it. You can read. It's not a big deal to God. Apparently you didn't read the Bible. You know, there's a, there's a verse in our Bible. A lot of people wonder, you know, how did, did anybody know how the, the number 13 got its designation as, a, as an unlucky number, negative number, number you want to avoid? Anybody know where that came from? No? Y'all just look at your Bible one time at Genesis 13, 13. Genesis 13, 13 is the only place in the entire Bible that lists excessively wicked. Not any other place in the Bible. Nowhere else in the Bible does it say, and it says here, the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Wicked sinners. Exceedingly. Nowhere else in the whole Bible does it ever identify anything as exceedingly wicked. Only one place. Genesis 13, 13. And as long as we're speaking of that tourist destination, <laughs> let's look at Jude chapter 1, verse 7. Jude, book of Jude only has one chapter. Jude chapter 7. In Jude chapter 7, again with so many of these verses, all of these different words and what exactly do they mean. Uh, and so I just went on a Bible program, printed out uh, 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 what, was, what was on the program. And here it said, even as, well, there we go again. Yes, Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities about them in like manner, that was the cities of the plain, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. I've been asked, what's the worst sin? I don't think there's necessarily one that's better, or one that's good, or one that's best. But I just do have to make one observation. Only one time in the Bible did the sands of the desert open up and swallow people alive into hell. Only one time. And that was rebellion against God's ordained authority. The only thing. Only time. And there was only one time that eternal fire, not, not the devil, right. eternal fire from God came out of heaven and consumed humans. The houses they lived in, all of their property and animals, and the, even the ground underneath them. Everything was consumed with fire, and that was Sodom and Gomorrah. And that's what it says here. Suffering an example of eternal vengeance, eternal fire. And so, so what exactly is strange flesh? Is that like somebody you don't know? 
because different translations translate it the uh, New Living Translation, which I know we have, says they were filled with immorality and sexual perversion. The English Standard Bible says they pursued unnatural desires. The New American Standard Bible says it was gross immorality. The Legacy Standard Bible says gross sexual immorality. The Amplified Bible adds unnatural vice. God's Word translation says they engaged in homosexual activities. And the International Standard Bible says they pursued homosexual activities. Now, I didn't write these translations. I didn't even translate these translations. I just made a copy of them. Just thought I'd share them with you. Because somebody apparently didn't read their Bible. Or they didn't study it. All right? You don't care if we go on? I'd just like to go on. All right. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We were right over there just a moment ago. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 gives a, uh, gives a list here. And on that list, on that list in uh, in verse 9, we have the NIV version. Can we just put that up? And then I know we have the New Living Translation as well. We have those, right? Yeah, we have both those. So let's, let's just look at both of those. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 in the NIV, it says, Don't you know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men. The New Living Translation says, Those who practice homosexuality. We'll just leave it right there uh, for, for those two verses. And then, and then, it's okay if I just have one more? Yes. Just one? Okay, all right. We'll just go to one more. One more. Romans chapter 1. Romans, the very first chapter. And uh, hand me my cell phone. <laughs> Going to take me just a second to get this little jewel fired up. <laughs> I love it. All right, let's start. Let's just start reading with uh, verse twenty-two because I think it is so absolutely apropos. Apropos. Uh, verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The verse before that says, because when they knew God, see, this isn't just anybody. Yes. When they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Neither were thankful, but they became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man, birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Therefore, I want you, if, if, if you write in your Bible, I want you to underline this phrase in verse 24. God gave them up. You see that? God gave them up. Verse 23. Excuse me, that was verse 24. Gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their bodies between themselves. Verse 25, they changed the truth of God into a lie 
You ought to underline, and you ought, you ought to really look powerfully at some of these verses. We're going to read through them, and then we'll come back to them. They changed the truth of God into a lie. They worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who, blessed, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up. Whoa. There it is again. What happened? God gave them up. Some of your translation says God gave them over. Turned them over. To their vile affections. For even their women changed the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, men, leaving the natural use of a woman, burned in lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of the air which is proper. For even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, here's the third time you're going to underline it, God gave them up. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God and they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do it. That's a pretty powerful portion of scripture. And so let, let's go back. And it says in again in verse 22, God professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Now watch this first. Look at verse 23. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. What happened here? To birds, four-footed beasts, creeping things. What did they do here? This is what's guilty. This is the body of Christ, not just the world, not just society. This is the body of Christ in my generation. They have brought God down to their level. Yes. They've changed the image of God into a corruptible man. Jesus is my buddy. He's my boyfriend. He's my pal. We're friends. I'm sure God will understand. God can relate to me. I can relate to God. I get God. I know God. A loving God would never do that. All speaking like you actually understand the great and awesome creator and, and, and eternal, eternal God. When no human can possibly grasp or comprehend his awesome majesty and greatness. They brought God down to their level. That's exactly what that verse says. They brought God down to a level they could relate to and treated him no differently than they do their pets, their four-footed beings. Their foolish heart was darkened. They became vain in their imaginations. They weren't thankful. They did not glorify him as God. You see it in verse 21? They didn't glorify him as God. They profess themselves to be wise. What does that mean? I know better than God knows. They, profess, they didn't profess God to be wise. He's the one that knows everything. He's the one that's perfect. We have to do it His way. We have to conform to His will. They didn't do that. They said, we know better. They said, we got this all figured out. And they brought Him down to their own level, changed the image of the uncorruptible, perfect God into an image made like unto a corruptible man, and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up. You better never lose your fear of God. Amen. You better never lose your reverence of God. You better never lose the awe of, 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 of even being given audience to the presence yes. of our God. Yes. The ones he's talking about here... Uh, 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 these are human beings. And it says God gave them up. That's fine if, if they want to do that, if they don't want to be thankful, if they don't want to glorify him as God, if they don't want to maintain that, that he's the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity. So he gave them up. He gave them up to the uncleanness of the lusts of their own hearts, 
to dishonor their bodies between themselves. This is what your Bible says. I thought I'd get maybe one amen there, but, but Lord, I know you're not easily offended. So, so I'll just look at a couple of translations. We, we, we've got them again, the NIV and the NLT, the New Living Translation. We'll just, we just go through a, a couple of these. This is uh, verse 24. God gave them over to their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. That's what your Bible calls it. The degrading of their bodies one to another. Verse 25. They changed the truth of God into a lie. What's the truth of God? That's his, that's his word. Jesus said, your word is truth. John 17, 70. This is the word of truth. And they changed it into a lie. Made it say what they wanted it to say. Made it say something that would defend their choices. And their lifestyle. That's what your Bible says. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. Traded, New Living says, they traded the truth about God for a lie. Verse 26 in the NIV. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. The New Living says, God abandoned them to shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. The NIV says, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. This is the B-I-B-L-E. Verse 27, in the same way, I'm reading from the NIV again, in the same way men abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust one for another. Men committing shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. I thought this wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> That's what I was told. The English Standard Version says men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Verse 28. Furthermore. Now, don't you sound like an orator? <laughs> like, I haven't said enough yet, so. Furthermore. Just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. The New Living says, they thought it foolish to acknowledge God. He abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that should never be done. That, that, that's your Bible. Verse 29 They've become filled with every kind of wickedness. Now, I want you to start listening real, real closely because it's pretty easy to sit in church on a Wednesday night and say, well, that's not talking about me. Come on. I didn't think anybody would say, yes, it is, Pastor. Okay. Let, let, let's, get, let's keep going on the list. You ready? Yeah. They become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil. Greed. Greed, depravity, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, they are gossips. Wow. The New Living, it's, it's pretty close. Every kind of wickedness, sin, greed, hate, envy, murder, quarreling. Well, I like a good argument once in a while. Come on, Pastor. No, no, here we go, right here. Deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. The English Standard Bible ends it and says, they are gossips. 
the Berean literal, it says wickedness, covetousness, malice. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, and gossip. Well, Pastor, I was shouting and waving a hanky and jumping up and down saying, preach it, Pastor, back when you were on verse 26 and 27 and 28. Why'd you have to go to this one? Because the Bible says they are gossips. It's just what the Bible says. This is wickedness. Your Bible, your Bible defines this as wickedness, evil, and it's greed. Greed. You read greed and envy and covetousness on this list. Verse 30, slanderers, God-haters. I like the New Living Translation. It says backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud. NIV says arrogant and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning. How about that? It's like the devil's list isn't even good enough. They invent new ways of sinning. And they disobey their parents. That's, that's the root of rebellion in life. That's, uh, that's where obedience and submission start. Now, this ought to really get your attention. Verse 31. And 32. They have no understanding. They break their promises. They're heartless. They have no love and no mercy. And although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. Yeah. There it is right there. Yeah. They approve of those who practice them. Well, you know, come on. I know you gossip once in a while, but everybody's got to vent on occasion. You just approved them doing something that the Bible calls grossly wicked and worthy of death. You just approved them. Well, I know that's your lifestyle. You do what you want to do. I'll do what I want to do. It's all okay. You just approved their lifestyle. You just approved it. And our God put you on the list when you did it. The New Living Translation says you encourage them. When you approve someone for their, for their gossip, for their envy, it's okay to be a little bit jealous. I mean, they've got more than you. I mean, everybody's just natural. You, you can't approve that. And you know what else you can't do? You can't take counsel from anybody that's on that list. Or you don't get blessed. Because blessed is the man that walks not in the ungodly counsel. Amen. Psalm 1, verse 1. You, you ought to be careful who speaks into your life. Yes. Yes. And it better not be one of these people on this list giving you advice, counsel, direction, guidance, sharing their wisdom with you, and you're listening to them. The Bible says right there, Bible says right there that uh, you do the same thing when you approve of them, when you encourage them. And Psalm 1, 1 says you can't be blessed when you accept counsel from them. The lines of life in America are getting more and more clear. Yeah. At one time, Moses stood out in the desert and took his staff and he made a line in the sand. That's where that statement, that, that, that phrase comes from. He made a line in the sand. He said, everybody that's on the Lord's side, come on over here. And everybody that's not sure and is confused and can't figure it out, you stay over there. And boy, the Levites ran to jump over that line. He said, who's on the Lord's side? You don't have to be on my side. You don't have to be on this church's side. You have to be on the Lord's side. And you have to make your mind up in life that everything is not gray. It's black and white. It's right or it's wrong. And it is in the Bible. Sorry that you think otherwise, but it is addressed in the Bible very clearly. And, 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 and I, I, I really don't think that there would be anyone who's present or 
in attendance watching and, and, and virtual or who will see this later that has any question uh, about what the Bible's talking about when it deals with Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 13 in the seventh verse of Jude in the second chapter of Second Peter and what the Bible's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And I don't even think we got to 1 Timothy, did we? No, we didn't. We, we didn't and, and, uh, but it's just another one of those verses that apparently got missed. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.8, we know the law is good if it's used lawfully. Uh, and then 9 and 10, and, and there's a whole list here. Yeah, there, there, there's, there's just a whole list here. Lawbreakers, rebels, ungodly, sinful, unholy, irreligious. Those who kill parents, it says. I love my device. <laughs> now it's just going to go blank on me. I guess we've got up here, we could go back to the NIV and, and just finish out this. Get rid of that thing for me. <laughs> verse 10. First Timothy 1 and verse 10. NIV. It's the next, there we go, for sexual immorality and those who practice homosexuality. Isn't that in, isn't that in the Bible? Yes, it is. Sure it is. Yeah, absolutely it is. Now let's go back to Galatians chapter 5 uh, and let's wrap up. I didn't want our teenagers to go exit and, Thank and, 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 Thank and miss the clear, concise, accurate, communicated truth of God's heart from the Bible. Amen. You don't care if I go on record again and just say, I don't hate anybody. Amen. I don't hate anybody. Well, you're a hater. I don't hate anybody. I love every single solitary human individual being and wish everyone to make heaven. Every single one. That's God's heart. That's my heart. That ought to be your heart. Every single one. Want them in heaven. Want them saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. Absolutely. All right. Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit. Again, you don't start a sentence with but. He lists here the works of the flesh, and these would be unrighteous practices. Yes. Unrighteous practices. Remember, if we, 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 we have our whiteboard up, it says righteousness, and that's declared being righteous, the declaration of God, your right standing with God. And then the other, the other category here is right living before God. There are just far too many Christians that they're confused and they're just in this gray area and they don't know what's right and what's wrong. And somebody just has to stand up and just say, this is what's wrong. Right. Envy is wrong. Envy is not feeling good about it because you've got something I don't have. Or jealousy, you got it, and, 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 and I don't know why I don't have it. I should have it. Or covetousness, I just want what you have. Doesn't matter if it's your cow or your horse or your car or your house. That's all works of the flesh. Okay, I'll make it simpler. That's wrong. Yes. Love, joy, peace, generosity, hospitality, assisting people in need. That's right. That's right. Lying is wrong. Honesty is right. Hating your enemies is not right. Loving your enemies is right. Forgiving everyone of everything they've done. That's right. Holding grudges and being bitter, that's wrong. 
And, and it ought to be that clear in our Sunday school. It ought to be that clear in our youth group. It ought to be that clear in our young adult teaching. It ought to be that clear in our church services. Christians shouldn't be confused about what Christian life looks like and Christian conduct looks like. And, and you, can, you can come uh, a long ways uh, to, to identifying and defining it over in Ephesians chapter 4. And, and there's a whole list starting, starting with... Uh, Verse 22, put off. That means get it off you. That means take it off and throw it far from you. Your former manner of living, which is corrupt according to deceitful desires and lusts. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You see, you see our whiteboard right there? Righteousness, that's right standing with God, and true holiness, that's right living before God. Righteousness and true holiness. Put away lying. See, people don't know it's not okay to lie. I've got Christian people that tell me, oh, it's okay to lie. <laughs> they go to church. They belong to church. They're a member of a church. They serve in their church. You can't, you can't just depend on just because a person is a church person that they tell you what a Christian should live like. Here, here's a, here's a dear Christian saint, a sister, and, and say, it's okay to lie, as long as it's a little lie. What's a little lie? See, some child is listening to you when you say stuff like that. They'll grow up a liar uh, and, and, and be on that list that, that, that God gave us there. No, lying isn't okay just because it doesn't hurt somebody, just a little bit, and just because it's a white lie. What's a white lie? Oh, dear. Here, I like this better. Put away lying. Yep. Not black lies, not big lies. All, just put away lying. <laughs> and speak everyone truth. truth to his neighbor. We're all members one of another. Don't let your anger cause you to sin. Here's a pretty simple one. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Did you know the days are getting shorter? The sun's going down earlier. You can't be mad as long. No wonder so many people go to the south for the winter. I finally figured it out. Longer days. Hallelujah. Don't give any place to the devil. I mean, mark that. Highlight it. Put some brackets around that verse. Don't give any place to the devil. Verse 28. Don't steal. Let him that stole, steal no more. Rather, go to work. Get a job, labor. Work with your own hands, that which is good, so that you have to give to him that needs. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. What's corrupt communication? Lying, cursing, doubt, slander, gossip, backbiting. Any corrupt communication? No. Only that which is good. Here, there's three things here. Good to the use of edifying, that's building up, that it may minister grace to the hearers. So if it doesn't minister grace and build up, (laughs) and is good, zip it. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness Wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. Be put away with all malice. Be kind one to another. Tender-hearted. Forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be imitators of God. You see that next verse? But be imitators of God. Well, how can I do that? Because his actual characteristics, his, his actual nature has been deposited inside of you. When you were born again. And those, those seeds, they're, they're in there. Yes. They're in there. Whoa. And instead of seeing anything on this list here, Ephesians 5 and verse 2, walk in love as Christ loved us yes. and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Back to, back to Galatians. He, he gives that whole list there. And yeah, there are things that, that, that aren't on this list. You know, beating your neighbor to a bloody pulp with a ball bat isn't on that list. Right? St- 
Stealing your neighbor's car isn't on that list. Cheating on your income taxes isn't on that list. There's a lot of things that aren't on that list that we can identify in other places in our Bible. Insurrection against your elected officials. That's not on that list. But if we look not very far into our Bible, we'll find all of those things in other places. We'll find them all. And there's no big sin, no little sin. No better sin or no worse sin. Well, I've never murdered anybody. Well, you're not arrogant either, I can see. <laughs> and arrogance and pride and haughtiness, they were all three on the list. Well, everybody else has sinned, but not me. Well, liars are on that list too. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. Don't ever let yourself get, get puffed up because there's some sin identified in the Bible that's identified as sin. No, I'm so glad I'm not like that. That's what that man said when Jesus yes. was, was, he was taking note, there's a man over here, there's a man over here, and the one over here said, I'm so glad I'm not like that tax collector down there. I come to church, I pay my tithes. I'm just, and then this man, he just got, he wouldn't even lift his eyes up. He just walked up before God, smote himself on the chest and said, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinner. The Bible says he went away justified. He went away forgiven. Don't ever compare yourself to anybody else. Let them stand before God. Let them fall before God. They'll give their account to God. Be careful your relationship with anybody and everybody. The Bible says evil companions will corrupt your good life. You Got to watch for that. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 33. And they make no friendship with an angry man, Proverbs said, because his anger will get off on you. You won't even know why. Yeah. It'll consume you. Yeah. The Bible says don't receive counsel from those who are ungodly. The Bible says don't give your approval or your encouragement. Or you're right on the same list. You as a Christian, you work on this. You work on this. You work on... Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.